Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello and welcome and joining me today to share the stories behind the 10 spiritual books that influenced her the most on her life journey is producer, teacher, integrative lifestyle practitioner and the woman behind the success of some of your favourite spiritual teachers programmes, Wendy Cohen. Wendy's not only had many years experience in the fields of meditation, mindfulness and wellness, she's also been a dynamic and instrumental force helping people from all over the world, both as a teacher and as an integrative lifestyle practitioner, and working up close and personal with some of the brightest minds in the wellness industry. Wendy spent several years at the Chopra Centre for Wellbeing, working with Deepak Chopra on some cutting-edge research in meditation and Ayurveda, and managing and facilitating their signature programme, Perfect Health. And she now plays a pivotal role as a director and member of the creative team at Lee Harris Energy, where she supports Lee's projects and courses and is a show producer for his weekly podcasts, Impact the World and It's Weird Being Human. Wendy Cohen, welcome. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad we've got you here at last, Wendy. Mm -hmm. So now tell us about... Um, reading I mean you've said that you are a voracious reader and you've been a voracious reader most of your life and uh, pretty much anything and everything <laughs> you know you'll get your hands on yeah yeah it's interesting Sandy as a child I was really shy and in fact that's more my tendency than being extroverted and so I escaped in books, like many people have said to me um, when they share a similar thing, that a book can befriend you and a book is a great place to get lost in and to learn. And I've always been somebody that has this insatiable curiosity. So even with a fiction, I, I go into, wow, what what are the layers to this character or how did this how did this writer come up with this vision and and then of course with spiritual books i mean there there's just no greater thing to kind of you know take yourself on a journey and to learn or be moved or be inspired or reminded and so you know i i'm taking a break from those right now and i'm reading summer beach reads you know um that are mm. fun and light and you know offer a different experience Absolutely, yeah. Do you um, have you always had an interest in uh, spiritual things, or was there a particular moment in time or incident that turned on your light? Yeah, um, that's such a good question, and I think that it's um, it's interesting because I think I've always been a seeker, you know, even from you know my young age. Um, but it was really when I was faced with a medical challenge that things got really real. You know, you have you hear about those moments that, um, yeah. you know, you you have a choice to um, embark on like the deepest healing and the and growth edges that you weren't expecting. And uh, for me, that was a diagnosis. And mm. um, and it kind of turned my world upside down, Sandy. And so I. I ended up wanting and needing more things to support me. Mm. What was the first spiritual book that you ever read? You know, it's a great question. Um, I would think that, you know, spiritual is such an interesting term because I think, you know, in all books you can find spiritual meanings, but I think really the mm. first one that that is more um you know, a very, very spiritually guided book is Deepak Chopra's Seven Spiritual Laws for Success. 
I mean, for mm-hmm. me, it, that was um, the book that really continues to stand out in my mind as as one of the most influential, life changing books that I still, you know, commit to reading um, as I go with my practice, you know, my meditation practice. So. I, I've I've had many spiritual experiences and many spiritual lessons up to reading that book, but that for me was something changed in me reading that book. Mm, yeah, and that book is on your list, and we will talk a little bit more about it. Um, and you, unlike most, you put your list in alphabetical order. Well, um, I, of course, you're person. very organized person, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> crazy yeah Yeah. that's that's okay it's all right you're allowed to be and and the first one on your list contains spiritual beliefs that spoke very deeply to you at a time when you were taking most of everything way too seriously you say and personally so I think that might give people a clue as to what I'm talking about it is of course the four agreements a practical guide to personal freedom by Don Miguel Ruiz and um, tell us how that book impacted you. Yeah, and I know this book is on so many of the people, you know, that you feature on their list. And I think that's that's definitely important to note here because it is just such a powerful book. And it's such a, the, the Toltec wisdom that's expressed in it is just really a way of life. Mm-hmm. And at the time, um, I was working at the Chopra Center and um, Don Miguel and his son were guests. And I saw him up on stage. And I had, of course, heard of the four agreements, but I never really picked it up. And I never really put it into practice. And for me, again, like you said, I was taking things very seriously. And, um, and very personally, Um, I'm a people pleaser, I'm a perfectionist, recovering. um, And I really felt, Sandy, that, you know, this was such an authentic way to approach some of my work personally in, in transform in transforming some things that weren't really serving me. And the book really speaks to how we create suffering on our own. And I was certainly doing that by taking things personally. And I love that it really teaches us to embrace being authentic and, and to, to not to have personal freedom in our lives that that I wasn't granting myself. So I think, you know, always do your best, be impeccable with your word. Those are such beautiful things to be integrating on a daily basis. And and that's what I started to do. And I still continue to do it's it's the book I recommend to clients. It's it's a gift that I give to a lot of people. It's it's an amazing, wonderful book. Mm. You said that you met uh, Don Miguel and his son, which son? Uh, his youngest. Ah, right. Yeah, um, I've interviewed um, Don Miguel Sr. and Don Miguel Jr. And um, you, they are, they're just lovely people. Wonderful. And, uh, yeah. And, you know, the, the what is shared in this book and in all of their books is on display in their characters right. all the time. Yeah, yeah. So, authentic, you know, authenticity. Authentic, you know, yeah. There are a lot of people that take the stage and they're not necessarily, um, you know, it doesn't always translate. And yeah. that was my experience with him. Yeah. Yeah. Were, were you, I mean, did you read Deepak's book after you joined the Chopra Center? After you started working there or before? Before. I, before. Um, yeah, I, I was a guest there for many years. Um, I found my way to the Chopra Center in a, in a way that, of course, seemed like it didn't make sense but of course you know the divine orchestration of the universe Mm. um and it's interesting because when i went i went actually to the property where the chopra center used to be and i i took myself there i was by myself feeling sorry for myself and um i walked into the center and uh, had a group meditation that was complimentary and actually, the person leading it was one of your featured guests, David G. Mm-hmm. And um, it was interesting because at the end of that guided meditation, they read the law of the day. And I thought, wow, this is so powerful. So I picked up the book right away and just dove into it and then continued to 
visit the Chopra Center until um, through a chain of amazing, wonderful events, then I became uh, part of their team and, uh, and served there for many, many years. Interesting how life works, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, book number two, you describe this as mindfulness meets neuroscience. Mm -hmm. And you say that it's a sweet go to book if you're feeling stuck, stressed or needing to reprogram your thoughts and reset. And it's called Just One Thing, Developing a Buddha Brain, One Simple Practice at a Time by Rick Hansen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is funny because um you know, a lot of people think that healing and spirituality and transformation um, is a really difficult thing and a deep thing. And I, and, I, and I believe that. But I also believe in doing little things. Um, and this was gifted to me by a client because my part of what I teach and try to mentor is, you know, do one thing. It doesn't have to be big. It can be little chunks at looking at how to make a change and enjoying your life or being good to yourself or being engaged in the world. And this book is really that. And what I love about it is it has the science-based information that I think is just really cool when it comes to, you know, the neuroscience and 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 how people change and what happens in our brains. And, you know, I I, I got uh I got to experience some of that research when I was working with Deepak, and I think it helps to understand, have another depth of understanding around why spiritual things or, mirror, or mindfulness really does help and make a big difference. So what I love about this book is there's every section, every chapter has a how section. So again, because I think a lot of times we read things in books, but then how do we integrate it? Yeah. And so I love it. And in fact, I picked it up this morning in preparation for today. And what was cute is that it reminded me. So um, one of the pillars is engage the world. And in that section is be curious and be generous. And, and it's really interesting because those are some of my core values. And I looked at the chapter and I thought, yeah, this is so good. If I was just to open the whatever page which is what I did this morning, um, and land on anything, it was so valuable to me. So this is a sweet little, like I said in my, in my list, that it's just a sweet reminder. And sometimes that's all we need, right? We just yeah. need to plant a seed or, you know, go back to something that we already know. And so I, I love this book for that reason. Yeah, I find the four agreements are great reminders for me. I'm always going, oops, when yeah. I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oops, no, you know yeah. this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So book number three is Sacred Powers, The Five Secrets to Awakening Transformation by David G. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so David G and I go way back, as I mentioned. Um, he has been one of my greatest teachers and mentors. And I found this book um, at a really pivotal time for me. I had left my role at the Chopra Center, which was um, where I really identified. And um, it really spoke to this book, really helped me to understand about new beginnings and recalibration and. It was. It came at a time where I was, in a sense, reinventing myself because I was um, teaching more and I was also doing one-on-one -on -one client work versus running programs and organizing events. And I love this book for so many reasons, mostly because I love David G. and I love his ability to translate so much wisdom in a way that is relatable and isn't too complex. And what I found myself doing is taking little bits of it and introducing it into um, my teaching. If I led a meditation, I'd read a small portion about an awakened heart. And I would ask some of the sacred questions. But what's wonderful about the experience of this book, similar to the other ones that we've already talked about, is it's kind of a great go-to book, you know, as reference. You know, am I connecting enough to my intentions? 
you know, am I, am I not asking the questions I need to ask myself? Um, so I, I love it. It's, it's has so much information and I think this book is best read in chunks, you know, to kind of take, mm -hmm. uh, take a sacred power and really dive into it and then mm -hmm. go back and, and rework it and then come back to it again and then move on. Um, but my favorite thing about this book was I discovered my winning formula. Did, did he talk about that when you had him on the show at all, the winning formula? Uh, I don't think he did, no. Okay. He talked more about, you know, the books that he'd enjoyed. Yeah, yeah. So the winning formula is introduced in this book, and it's really, I thought it was, I, it was an unexpected gift. And really our winning formula is the thing that we innately have that 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 leads us to different things and when we i know what our winning formula is like for him he says his winning formula is that he has a sense of humor and he's able to use his humor to to engage people so it doesn't matter what he's teaching or talking about mm. and so i had to really look at okay what's my winning formula and when i discovered it it was really interesting because then it 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 made sense why I do certain things, and then how to capitalize on that, on those things and those gifts. And so, um, you know, it, it, that was a really kind of unexpected thing as a takeaway from, from reading Sacred Powers. Are you going to tell us what your winning formula is? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. So what I, what I, what I realized about myself is that um, my winning formula is that I'm curious I care and I work hard. So what's interesting about certainly in the place I am now professionally and personally is that it doesn't really matter if I'm uh, working one-on-one -on -one with a client or producing a podcast or supporting a course or um, doing my own work in the world. Those three things are always, always core parts of, of everything that I do. And so now I kind of pay attention to that um, as my formula, and I've been very lucky to find myself, you know, doing the work that I love and learning from people who are, you know, some of the brightest minds in the mm -hmm. world and creative and wonderful. So um, I think it's important for people to figure out their their winning formula. So how how do we figure it out? Well, I think it's sitting with what what is what is innate. And what, what happens to us when we just show up as ourselves? You know, it, it's like, you know, I, I was reviewing my books again this morning and I thought they all have the thread of leading me to wanting to be more authentic. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and really like one of your, I think part of your winning formula, Sandy, the little bit that I know of you is that you're, you're a connector and mm -hmm. you're, you're somebody that likes to share information. Yeah and gems yeah. so so i would say that's probably yeah. a good part of your winning formula yeah shameless sharer i call myself yeah, yeah. you know i'm shameless i can't stop doing it no but isn't that beautiful and that goes back yeah. to what i read this morning and just yeah. one thing it's about being generous about yeah. you know sharing what we can and what what also yeah. lights us up and brings us joy you know that yeah. we need yeah. more yeah. yeah it also helps being a gemini because you know gemini's <laughs> have to have to communicate so they can't just have something and not tell everybody yes, <laughs> you know well, we make bad liars <laughs> yeah yeah it's wonderful though wonderful yeah. i love that you um you love you know you've had the opportunity to work with so many great people and and learn from them and clearly you know, contribute to their work as well. I mean, it's a two-way street. You know, you're giving something to them; they're giving something to you. But that's, you know, it's it's um, it's living in your passion, isn't it? And working in your passion. Yeah, I, I some days I wake up and I go, "How did I get this lucky?" You yeah. know, I, it, it hasn't been without hard work and and commitment, yeah. And investment. But yeah, I have um, I have found myself in rooms with people that you know that people would only dream of being with. And, and for me, it's always been, um, 
such a humble experience to be in the presence of, of visionaries and people that are, you know, helping people heal and transform. And it's never, ever lost on me, my good fortune. Um, and I, and I think because I'm a constant student and I love learning and that's part of what makes me, me, I somehow co-created it and manifested yeah. it. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm so deeply grateful. Uh, and, and, and it, they have each, each of these teachers have come at the most divine time. You, you know, you, you can't make this stuff up. No, you can't. Um, and so I'm, I'm incredibly fortunate that I have found what my passion is and, and how, you know, it's funny. Um, a couple years ago, I started saying yes to the things, um, that only provided fun for me. It was, I call it follow the fun. And, um, and what I found in following the fun was I was aligning to my greatest joy. And that was being with people who inspired me or working with clients who um, I felt a kinship with or felt um, that common humanity. And it was uh, just incredible. So mm -hmm. I, I follow the fun and uh, it, it brings me to some amazing places. Yeah. You know, and I want anyone watching this to understand what you're saying here. I mean, people tend to think, oh, it's OK for you to talk. You've had all of that, but I can't have it. Anyone can have it. Anyone can have it. It's available to all of us. You know, we've just got to desire it, intend for it and then work for it. Right. And I also think, too, you know, joy is such an important part of of life. And I know we're living in very challenging times and, you know, a time like no other. I think the joy is so important in in healing and in spirituality. And, and um, I think if we are following that more, um, then it, it changes who we are and, and then the choices yeah. that we make. And Yes, it's it's and I'm somebody that takes things very seriously. I'm very cerebral. I'm a thinker. I'm a seeker. But I also have this side of me that wants to be in, in experiences that are fun. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, book four in your list is The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. And, uh, you know, let's not forget the subtitle, A yeah. Practical Guide to the Fulfillment of Your Dreams. Take note, everybody. Um, say a little bit more. I mean, you talked about the um, uh, each day of the week, you know, looking at a different law. And, you know, I've not read the book, funnily enough. Um, I don't know why not, but clearly I should. But um, I was intrigued when you said that, um, you know, it, a law for each day of the week, and it starts with the law of pure potentiality, which is on Sunday, yeah. which, of course, you know, the beginning of a week, yeah. everything is possible. Yeah. And it ends with the law of Dharma, which I think is very apt. You know, at the end of the week, you're going to reap whatever you sowed. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, again, uh, this is, I, I mentioned this earlier, that I think out of all the 80 plus books that Deepak is reading, I think this is the most powerful. And it is basic principles that are really connected to the laws of nature that help us to understand um, how we can put things into practice. And so, yes, every day is the law of the day. Today is the law of intention and desire. And so what I do and the way I think it's best experienced is you read the law of the day. It's a very short chapter. And then at the end of each chapter, there are three things that are suggestions as a way to integrate them. And so for I'll use today as an example. So it says to, you know, connect to your list of intentions, to write a list, look at the list before you meditate, before you go to bed. Um, you know, be very connected to, hey, what is it that I really want in my life? And, um, and, and then you keep going back to it. And so I did this early on, Sandy, where I wrote my list. Um, it's funny, I wrote it with a green pen, which is just bizarre, because green, of course, is the heart chakra color. And I wrote that list and kept that list in, in tucked inside the book. And every Thursday, 
I would meditate, I'd, I'd read the list and I'd connect to it very specifically on Thursdays. And it's so funny because later on when I was teaching at the Chopra Center, I would share that list and how many things that I actually was able to manifest because I was connected to my list of intentions and desires. And that's just one out of many examples. Um, again, I think that when you are consciously aware of something daily, like a daily ritual, there's something very potent about that because it's in your awareness. It's in your energy field. You can access it. And so this book has become um, just part of my daily practice. I don't necessarily read it anymore because it's been, uh, gosh, a dozen plus years, maybe even more, two, 15 years plus. And so I, I know the book um, backwards and forwards. I've taught on the seven spiritual laws. And, you know, depending on where you are in your life, you know, one of the laws Friday is the law of detachment. Such a good law, especially right now um, with uncertainty and letting go and, um, Again, not rigidly holding on to things that um, no longer serve us. And, you know, as you move through your life cycle, I'm an empty nester now. So, you know, detachment, you know, several years ago when my kids, you know, went off to college and then are doing their own lives, it was it was such a valuable, helpful, you know, law to practice. And um, they're all really mm -hmm. quite special. And I, I love to teach this and I, I've taught parents this to help teach the, teach their little ones about, again, um, you know, the law of karma, you know, is about the choices we're making, you know, how, how do I make choices that, that bring good uh, and how do I, you know, hold myself responsible for the choices that I make and the law of least effort, Sandy is a great one, you know, that's on mm -hmm. Wednesday and that's go with the flow, you yeah. know. Just don't force things, you know, look at nature, you know, the sun doesn't try to rise or set, it just does, you know, grass mm -hmm. doesn't try to grow, it just does. And so that, that one was a, was one for me to work on for a long time because, you know, I was brought up with the no pain, no gain, work harder, do more. And this is all about, well, just be, just be and see what happens, see what shows up, you know, when you aren't trying to force solutions. And so I could go on and on and on about this book. I'm going to send you this book as a gift because I think that you will love it. I and will love it. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's really, it's, um, it's like a friend to me that, that I, you know, um, pay respect to every day. Uh, so. I love it when people tell me about books that become more than just a one read kind of book. I mean, you know, we get so much from books and there are so many books to get a lot from. Yeah. Um, but to find certain books like um, The Four Agreements, mm -hmm. um, like The Seven Spiritual Laws, I mean, these are, you know, such basic fundamental um, guidelines for life, yes. um, you know, that they can't help but be like Bibles for people. Right, right. I mean, and that's the thing. It's so funny. I, but that's the common thread in, in most of the books that I've recommended yeah. in my list is that they're almost like reference books. They're, and mm -hmm. sometimes I don't even necessarily read them all the way through. I go back and I, and I, I, I revisit sections or I, I don't start from the beginning and I just go right to a chapter that, that really brings me or it, it just kind of speaks to me. And, you know, spiritual books are, are that, that's really what's wonderful about them. My problem, though, is I give them all away. <laughs> so because I want to share them. So sometimes yeah. I, I have to remember that, oh, I gave away, you know, this book um, because I, I knew someone would benefit from it. But yeah. yeah, I agree with you. They're wonderful that way. Yeah. So book number five is another one that I don't know. Strong at the Broken Places, oh. Voices of Illness, A Chorus of Hope, Richard M. Cohen. When I read up on this book, I thought, I don't know how I've missed this one um, because it sounds like a fabulous, I mean, it's a major bestseller as well. Yeah. So I found this book um, when I I had some really significant medical challenges Um 
starting in 2003 and then uh, really very challenged in 2008, 2009. And I saw Richard Cohen, who's the author, um, on a talk show. And I had been following Richard a little bit because he suffers from MS. And although that's not what I have, I, I do have uh, an autoimmune disease. And I was so compelled to read it because he features um, very brave and vulnerable people that have chronic illness. And it was at a time, Sandy, that I didn't feel understood. I, I was um, in a place that so many people in my life were having to figure out how to navigate me being in a different um, state of health. I was always somebody that was really, you know, um, active and um, involved and my life got turned upside down. And so this book brought to me um, an, an, a deeper understanding of how these people featured in the book. One woman in particular had Crohn's disease and I was really struck by her story and her sharing and how, you know, how she was navigating that in her life. And it was very honest and, and it wasn't sugar-coated and it was real. And that's really what I needed at the time. And, uh, and really for anyone that's just not even, that doesn't even have, you know, health issues, it's just a beautiful read because it's about people that are getting up every day and managing and navigating their lives, you know, with, with, you know, courage and vulnerability and, you know, we can all, can all learn from that. Mm, yeah. It said in, in um, I think the explanation about it, that this is a book born of the desire of many to share their stories in the hope that the sick and those that love them will see that they're not alone. It is, I mean, illness is a very, um, you know, it divides you. It separates you from others and from life. And, um, you know, I understand what Crohn's disease is like. I've got relatives who suffer from that. And, you know, people with MS and other um, autoimmune diseases that are not going to go away, it really, you know, it does create a different life. Yeah. yeah. So it and is important for them to know they're not alone. Yeah, it is really important. And I think, too, what... I found very, very valuable is that we learn from other people's experiences. You know, there, there's something in that storytelling that translates in such a yeah. heartfelt way that I think sometimes, I mean, that's where I tend to be the most affected if, if people are just sharing um, their experience. And so I think there's something in that too. Um, that was very that's very appealing to me in this book mm. you know this is something that I was thinking about only this morning um, one of the things that I love about these interviews which are quite different from any interview I've ever done any series of interviews I've ever done before is it's great hearing about the books and it's you know it's very useful to have this archive of recommendations but the bit I love is hearing about the stories behind the book and hearing people telling about their story not because they've written a book about it or right. you know they're pitching something about it but just hearing people's stories yeah. they're, just, they're just fascinating and they're so important because as you say we learn from every single one of them right right yeah mm -hmm. and and really um the books are the books are just part of the journey right that, that yes. we take along with with yeah. it yeah yeah so the next book number six sensitive is the new strong the power of empaths in an increasingly harsh world anita Mojani. um love anita's work mm -hmm. Yeah, I again, I have I've had the good fortune to spend some with her, um, and she is somebody that I think is spot on with knowing that now is the time to be talking about this because yeah. again, um, I know I've always been highly sensitive and empathic, and um, and I think 
at times I've thought, oh, well, that's not always a blessing. Sometimes that's a curse because I feel things deeply. I experience things um, at a depth that some people don't. And um, I think right now her, this book, is so important because our leadership needs to be more sensitive and um, the, the aspects of what makes us highly sensitive is important because I think oftentimes we don't know what to do with it. You know, we, we, um, we either feel like we don't belong in the world because it's a small few of us, you know, that are having these experiences. And so, I love the timing of this book. I, I think Anita is a beautiful translator um, in anything that she talks about because it's heartfelt and it's yeah. true. And, um, you know, her, what I really, my takeaway from this book was how do I move more to self love? You know, how, to, how can I be more compassionate and, and loving with myself? I, I always recommend it to other people, <laughs> be kind and gentle and, and, you know, be loving to yourself. But oftentimes I, I don't necessarily point it back at myself. And I love that book for that reason, a remembrance of, yeah, it's important to have that. Um, and especially during, you know, the times we're having right now where things yeah. feel intense and, and the energy is strong and, you know, there's a... Um, there's so much that we're having to navigate and being sensitive is, is, is good. It's strong. It's positive. It's yeah. not, it's yeah. not a negative thing. And I think too often yeah. we, we tend to think that, Oh, I wish I wasn't so sensitive or we get the messages from people. Oh, you're overly sensitive. And so this book is wonderful. Mm. So the next book was named by Forbes magazine as one of the five books that will actually change your outlook on life. Um, and it is The Gifts of Imperfection. Let go of who you think you're supposed to be and embrace who you are by Brene Brown. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, this this book. I was trying to think, Sandy, when I read it and I and I, I couldn't place the time. But I know when I read it, it was like life changing for me. Um, I've alluded to my perfectionism and I, I've, it's my, it will continue to be my work, my personal work. But what I love about this, it was about wholehearted living, you know, about being authentic, being vulnerable, letting go of shame, um, you know, embracing imperfections. And I, I think that's so important. I know for me, that is um, the way I want to live my life. I, I don't, I, I'm learning that um, perfectionism is, is not healthy. <laughs> it's not something I want. And so this book just offers that reminder again, to be more loving and to be, um, to come from a place of worthiness you know, to embrace the things that we don't love about ourselves, but make us who we are. And again, that self-compassion. And I think she speaks so beautifully to vulnerability. I, and I, and I, also, mm -hmm. I also think as an author, she's real. She's, I've seen her speak as well. And she's um, the real deal. And I, I appreciate that. Yeah, and that's much needed today. I mean, you look at the, the young girls, who all have an ideal that's, right. you know, on TikTok or Instagram of what perfectionism is, what perfection right. is, and they want to be the same, you know, and 10 years ago, perfection was something else. Right. Um, and in 10 years' time, it will be something else again. So right. it is it's something that is unreal anyway. It is, right. You know, and yet here we are all thinking that we have to be perfect in order to gain approval. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, so much of it is about is about that acceptance or what we what we think other people yeah. want. And yeah, I I think this book is a really important one. 
Well, I will tell you that when I was reading about this book, I immediately went and bought it oh, because I thought, oh, OK, I've got to read this one. Yeah, yeah. You know, I love that about your um, list. You know, from time to time, I uh, come across books on people's lists that I think, oh, yeah, that's something I put on my list. But I think this is the first time I've acted on it immediately. Oh, good, good. <laughs> so, yeah, that. so you did a good job. Thank you. Um, the next one is, um, again, it's, you know, I, what I love about these books is is the humanity, mm. you know, the humanity in them. This one is called Untamed, mm. and it's by the activist, speaker, and best-selling author and, quote, patron saint of female empowerment, mm. Glennon Doyle. I'm a human being meant to be in perpetual becoming. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Say more about this. Yeah. When I read, and in fact, I just got goosebumps again. When I read that, I thought, yes, this is about becoming. You know, I'm in, I'm in the phase of my life that um, I'm really wanting to let go of old stories or people pleasing or some of the things that are not really helping me become who I am meant to be. And I, I, I think Glennon does an incredible job and service to people who are not really living the lives that they really want to live, you know, and she so bravely mm -hmm. um, shares her journey in little vignettes throughout the book. But really, I, I think I mentioned this in my list. It was the prologue. It was the, it was the initial reading of a visit that she took her daughter to the zoo and they encountered a cheetah, um, Tabitha, I think, and and it was that she was a caged animal, not really, not really living the life that that this animal was supposed to be living, and what that represented for her, and and how we sometimes make choices because we think that's what we're supposed to do, and you know, again, going back to being authentic and being real, and and becoming, you know the best version of yourself without, you know, without hesitation or apologies. And, you know, in my fifties, that that's really important to me. It's really important to me. So, so all of her sharing, and I also really appreciate that she comes to it in with a sense of humor. Um, you know, one of my greatest teachers, David Simon, who was the co-founder with Deepak, I, my very first meeting with him um, as a guest, he said, you know, you're taking everything way too seriously and you need to come at this with, with again, a, a lighter heart and more playfulness and, you know, what do you do for fun? And, and I didn't get it. I thought, oh gosh, no, if I'm meant to be learning something, it, it was that it was serious and it was deep and it was so not that. And so I think Glennon does a beautiful job in how she weaves in you know the the light-hearted moments in a in a in a moment that is of deep healing and so and and her activism and and just doing hard things and being brave i think it's such an important message right now for for all of us so i, I love the book um it, it, mm. it was one of my favorite books last year that i read yeah. Well, there's a piece that I highlighted that really spoke to me um, when I was reading about the book. And I think it's something that she obviously writes at some point in the book. And I'm just going to read it because I don't think any woman watching this and man, because it applies to them just as much, um, you know, will not feel a connection to that. There is a voice of longing inside each woman. We strive so mightily to be good good partners, daughters, mothers, employees, and friends. We hope all this striving will make us feel alive. Instead, it leaves us feeling weary, stuck, overwhelmed, and underwhelmed. We look at our lives and wonder, wasn't it all supposed to be more beautiful than this? We quickly silence that question, telling ourselves to be grateful, hiding our discontent, even from ourselves. I mean, who wouldn't, you know, relate to that who yeah. wouldn't man or woman i don't right. care everybody right. yeah 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 well, that's, well, clearly that's, one that yeah very powerful very yeah. very powerful yeah. yeah yeah one that definitely needs to be on everybody's list mm -hmm. so book number nine who moved my cheese by <laughs> spencer 
Spencer John. It's fast, it's simple, and it works, you said. Yeah, and it's so funny because again, this would this is really um, I think I don't even think this is in the spiritual self development section of a bookstore. No, it's business. It's business. Yeah. And and it's so funny because my friend Gordon recommended me to add this to this book be, to the, my list because it's unconventional. But what I find is that in my one on one work that I do, my clients seem to and i've had been in this situation too i'm sure you have too sandy with with managing change you know and this book is the sweet little story of him and ha and the and the mice and it's so funny that again it's all about looking at are we making it more difficult than it needs to be which oftentimes we are and also just that change is a big spiritual subject you know, letting mm. go or seeing things in a new way or um, really shifting perspective, you know, that those are such big spiritual concepts in this little book that, you know, again, is not conventional in terms of being a spiritual book. And so mm. that's why I added it to the list. And um, yeah, I, I, I think it's it's helpful um in looking at it in a in a way too that isn't you know too heavy it's lighthearted and it's to the point you you get you get the you get the idea of what the author is trying to you know translate and uh yeah so that was my little unexpected my um yeah addition to 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 this list <laughs> well it was written some time ago but it is very very relevant because everyone everyone is experiencing change right now and doesn't know when that change is going to end <laughs> right. what's on the other side of it so yeah right that's another another good one well timed yeah. yeah so number 10 one of my favorites is who would you be without your story oh, dialogues with byron katie uh-huh. yeah so again i had the good fortune to experience byron katie and see her do the work. And again, it's so interesting that at this time when I read this book, I think it was around, I don't know, 2010-ish, I think that I was really into my story and I and the narrative that unfortunately um, was that, you know, you're not well and this is your story, this is, you, this is your path and reading about the different people in this book and her taking them through the work i thought god they're they're so stuck in their stories and i was so i was so judgy and like god how and because some of it is is absolutely like in some ways ridiculous when you hear people really when she's asking is it true is it absolutely true and they're like no it's true like and and there's no there's no way about it so it it really helped me look at wait wendy (laughs) you're in your story girl you're in your story and you need to stop it and um and so i love i love her work i i think that um it's important to get to the truth and i think once i realized i am not my story although certainly i have had all of these experiences to bring me where i am now but i am not my story um it completely changed things for me and the trajectory yeah. of, of of what of what happened next for me when i had that moment of i am not my story so yeah. those perceptual shift moments are so powerful and her work is filled with them i've watched her several times in person mm-hmm. and uh you know on video and listened to her bought her cds mm-hmm. and i am just blown away at the you know the downright common sense of it all but we just don't think about it I you know I have a story that I share with everybody that really impacted me and with um with Katie she um was with a group of people that she was teaching I think and somebody stood up and said that there was something that they couldn't get out of their head um and it was a true story and i remember when it was on the news of somebody in la who had thrown a dog out of a car into the traffic and all she could say is how terrible it was and you know and and she couldn't get it out of her head because this person threw the dog in the traffic and 
you know, and it was really a big thing for this woman. And, um, you know, I mean, Kate is very down to earth and very direct. And she just said, you know, it's not for us to say what he should and shouldn't have done. You know, it's not for us to judge. However, she said, how many times did he throw the dog in the traffic? And the girl said, once. And she said, how many times have you thrown the dog in the traffic? Mm-hmm. And that, for me, was like, oh, my God. Yeah. You know, it really makes you realise yeah. what your thinking is doing. Yeah. And that changed it for that girl completely, right yeah. there and then. You know, yeah. that was gone. Yeah, and, and that's what's so powerful about, about her work is that mm. it cuts right in. Yeah. And and again, yeah. what what resonated with me with this book because you know she she loving what is is another fabulous yes. um, book. But I chose this one because I again it was the storytelling. It was it was yeah. the actual looking at um, a human experience happening because really what she did, she did in this book was take the work that she had done around the world and then put together fifteen you know um, stories of, around that or yeah. and sharing and very powerful and and her in a room is just i i um i was standing it was at the choker center and there was um i was running the microphones in this in the audience and a girl volunteered to do the work with her and so i was next to her um just kind of holding space for her and supporting her and that exchange was was so incredibly you know that it was it was tangible, you know, it, it, it just, it, I can't even describe it really, but the energetic exchange there and then the, 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 the actual transformation that was happening right there, right then was just, yeah. it blew my mind. Yeah. 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 I've watched people walk off that stage looking like a different person as if somebody's lifted the world off their shoulders. Yeah. Um, it is immediate and it's very, very visible. Yeah. And I, yeah. It's one of those things where, you know, people can't argue with it. It gets to a point where you just, and they go blank and then they shift. Right. And I think, I think even just on a daily basis, sometimes I'll, when I get caught up in a story or I'm, you know, making a narrative, I'll stop and I'll just say, is it true? Like, is this absolutely true? And then it stops me from going down that, that terrible rabbit hole that, you know, we can go down, but yeah. It's, it, I love that book for so many reasons. And I, I went to find it. Um, and of course, I gave that book away too. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, that's your 10 books. And, um, you know, there are, from, from my perspective, you know, there are delightful 10 because every single one of them, you know, I could relate to every single one um you know I'm grateful for all of the contributions but occasionally I come across a list and it's it's a joy to talk about it because you know I I can find a passion for every single one of them and that's true of your list so thank you for that um I want to talk a little bit about um your um your diagnosis and um how you found meditation and mindfulness um, on your path to healing. Um, how much, I mean, just tell us a little bit about that, about what meditation and mindfulness actually did for you. Yeah. Oh, gosh, Sandy. So in 2003, I was diagnosed with this really rare autoimmune disease, um, bounced around from doctor to doctor. And like I said earlier, I was a marathon runner and a martial artist, and I was even the PTA president, which is something I would never do again. <laughs> um, but I went from having that life to having um, pain in my body and uh, uh, just a complete um, upheaval of the life that I knew. And I didn't navigate it well. Um, I, I was paralyzed by fear. I was making choices to, um, to just kind of make everyone around me happy. And, um, and I, I just was somebody that was always really connected to myself and I felt a complete disconnect. And so, like I said earlier, I had, um, taken myself to, uh, La Costa, which is the property that the Chopra Center used to be on. 
and I wandered in and had that group meditation. And it was something that I just was not really expecting. Um, and what happened is I went back a couple weeks later and I received a personal mantra and I just started a daily practice. And what I found is that um, I was I was allowing myself to be still and quiet enough to get more, have more sense around what I was experiencing. And so because of that, then I was able to make different choices. And um, so I fell in love with meditation in 2005 and have been a meditator ever since. And, you know, what I found um, and, and when I teach meditation, I, it's with the idea that we give ourselves just, just enough space to, to just be. You know, like Deepak always says, we're human beings that are always doing, doing, doing. And so for me, meditation has been a the most amazing gift I've ever given myself. It allows me to um, to connect and to remember and to um, be with my thoughts. Because, of course, you know, a lot of people think you sit down to meditate and the thoughts go away and they don't. You know, thoughts are part of the experience. It's more about, you know, redirecting back to being still and being with it all. And... Um, so yeah, it for me it has been life changing uh, with how I manage, you know, not only health things but also how I manage just my day to day. Um, you know, am I being more reflective um, and more compassionate and grounded and loving, um, or am I being reactive? You know, and so it 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 helps in so many different areas, and I could go on and on about that. I so it's helped you with regard to um, your condition as well. Yeah. So there's there there there's been a journey with that, of course, like most people. Um, but for me, my practice allowed me to find myself in situations and in in places at the right time where I allowed myself to receive things. And as a result, it guided me to making different choices because that's what happens when you are more connected to, you know, to yourself, not, not Mm -hmm. the ego self, but the self beyond the mind, the intellect and the ego. And you tap into, wait a second, you know, who am I here? What do I really want? Um, How can I serve? And, and for me, it came at a time that um, although I had, um, I, I learned to meditate in 2005 and, and really um, things for me were the most challenging three to four years after my, after that, um, what it did help me do was to build a different relationship with pain, um, to not operate from a place of fear, but more in a place of being creative um or 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 more reflective and um and it, because i was committed to that practice i wanted to become a teacher i wanted to actually i just wanted to learn more sandy i had no intention of teaching meditation or doing anything that i did um at the chopra center i really just loved the teachings and and in anything i do i always want to learn more and so it was really, once I started teaching also, I really had another layer of healing around it um, because I realized just how much it had helped me um, and how it continues to help me in, in all that I do. Um, so you, you're teaching meditation um, and you have one-on-one sessions with people. I mean, is that all around meditation or are you doing other things? No. So I, when I left the Chopra Center back in 2017, um, I was doing a lot of one-on-one coaching or integrative work. I have a background also in Ayurveda and I've done a million different trainings because I'm that constant student. And so when I work with my clients and many of them, I've worked with them for years. um, It's a very integrative, intuitive um, process. And I, I weave in meditation and mindfulness and um, NLP and Ayurveda. And I just take 
all the tools in the toolbox <laughs> and and I look at ways that I can help people feel aligned. And um, I've been doing it now um, since 2017, and I am doing it less and less because my creative work is, is is shifting. But I love that. I love to um, explore things with people and um, be curious and and um, help people find meaning and um, and also I I'm I'm a very lighthearted practitioner in that I want the experience to to not feel like it's a burden and not feel like it's so intense that people don't want to do the work. You know, I, I, I've, I've learned from mentors like David G and uh, Lee Harris and, and different people in my life that you can come to this in a way that doesn't have to feel um, so heavy and so deep. And so that's kind of kind of what I do um yeah mm -hmm. and you're currently working with Lee Harris and yeah. producing his podcasts which must be great fun so much fun um we had uh we had someone in studio yesterday um a beautiful teacher Debbie Brown who I've known over the years I met her through the Choker Center and it was a two it was a Wednesday afternoon and I thought wow I'm, I'm in the midst of a beautiful conversation. Um, this conversation is going to go out into the world and it's going to ripple and it's going to help people. And I get to be part of it. And it's, it's amazing. I, yeah. I love my creative work and I find that again, it's been really fun. This, I did not see producing a podcast <laughs> in, in my work, you know, a couple of years ago, I, it wasn't something that was even in my radar, but the idea that I could organize something and support something that I care about and and the ripple effect of that. So it's it's been a lot of fun and we're approaching um a hundred shows almost. And wow, um, that many. Yeah, and you were a great cool. guest on the show. And um and yeah, it's just it's wonderful that um some people that are more well known um, to the audience and, and other people that are doing amazing things to impact and, you know, yeah. they're, they're change makers. It's super cool. It's fun. Yeah. It's a great podcast series and Lee is a natural, yeah. uh, an absolute natural. Yeah. 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 So I don't need to ask you what gets you out of bed in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, no, you, you don't. And, and it's funny because I get up and I'm excited to do what I'm doing. Um, and I've been so grateful to have it, especially during COVID. You know, yeah. it, it, for me, it's it. I feel incredibly lucky that I can pour my energy and my love and 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 what I have in me into that. Um, because, gosh, the world really needs it right now. Um, and the fact that I can get up and feel excited about what I'm doing is is such a blessing. I'm so mm -hmm. lucky, so so lucky. Well, you earned it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Wendy, that brings us to the end, I think, unless there's something that you want to share with our audience. No, I just, I really want to thank you, Sandy. And I and I want to thank you for thinking of me. Um, I also appreciated that you hung in there with me. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people get intimidated by this um, process and, I realized I overthink I, I overthought it. I, I I really was way too hard on myself in the process. <laughs> so I want to thank you for the learning that came from that. Um, but thank was you. it easier in the end than you thought? Um, I think it, it well, yeah. I mean, and this has been so lovely. I, I again, like I think it's Thursday morning here in in California, and I'm thinking, what a cool way to spend my morning and. And I appreciate this conversation and the opportunity to share a little bit. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. I mean, most people feel that it's a little bit daunting, but afterwards they've all said that was actually a really interesting experience, you know, yes. to go back over your life and look at the books that influenced you. It's a bit like a life review. And yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So thank you mm. so much. 
Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Wendy. Thank you so much. It's good to talk with you. Yeah, you too. You too. Um, if people want to know more about you, do you have a website? I couldn't find one. I don't. And it's so funny, Sandy, because I own wendycohen.com. Um, it's been on my to-do list for many years. And I realized I'm just more private in my work. So I guess um, the best way for them to reach me would be, um, gosh, through LinkedIn or through Facebook or somewhere there. Um, I'd be happy to connect. Um, and it's so funny because I'm still really feeling like I don't really want to have a website. Um, and well, then don't. I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. 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 Well, Wendy Cohen, thank you for adding your 10 best spiritual books to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's library of recommendations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. Lots of love. You too. And thank you for joining us. You can see previous videos in this series on our YouTube channel, as well as the video page at nobsspiritualbookclub.com, where you can also sign up to our newsletter and be the first to know about these weekly interviews. That's it for this week. I hope you'll join me again at the same time next week. Till then, it's goodbye from me.